turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. Wow, it's been a long time since I've said that. 2 Peter chapter 2. And I'm going to be very honest with you. We're going to get into a portion starting now at verse 10. We left off uh, from uh, verses 4 to 9, and today we get into verse 10 to 22. And I want to tell you, I studied verses 10 to 22. And uh, normally uh, the messages I bring to you are about 9 to 10 notes on my page, and when, when this morning I threw away, I threw away so much, and then bring my notes down to what it's gonna be for this Sunday morning, I had 25 pages of notes, and exactly. So we're gonna be staying here for the next three hours. We'll be, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So what happened was, we are gonna be uh, opening a, a, a portion of what Peter is revealing to us in 2 Peter chapter 2, and that is uh, what is a message entitled, What You Really Need to Know. Remember, we've been on that in chapter 2, but this is what you really need to know about who's out there. Peter is going to be exposing and giving us the description and the characteristics of false ministries and false teachers, and that's where we left off in our march. We are talking about a study that we have coined, <clears throat> excuse me, Combat Faith, because that's exactly what Peter is talking about. And I, I, I tell you, little did we know that we'd be living in a day and an age that that theme uh, would be so incredibly relevant today. So listen, I'll begin with the even-numbered verses. If you'll read out loud the odd-numbered verses, if you have a New King James Version Bible, read along. If you do not, please look to the screen to read along as we'll be in the New King James Version. Second Peter chapter 2, I'll start, verse 10. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed, and they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. But these like brutal beasts or brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of things they do not understand, and will utterly perish in their own corruption. Wow. Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. Verse 16, but he was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumb donkey speaking with the man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. Wow. Verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness. The ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow having been washed to her wallowing in the mire. <laughs> That's pretty graphic. Father, this is pretty terrifying stuff. This is your Bible. This is the word of God. And Lord, I would assume that it'd be much easier to not even study these kinds of things. And yet as we go chapter by chapter through 2 Peter, we know that every word, and as the ancient Hebrews taught and the scribes, that even the space between the words 
will someday be interpreted by the Messiah when he returns. Well, Lord, we praise you this morning that your Holy Spirit is here to teach us. So, Lord, give us light, we pray. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. You can be seated. And um, as we look to this portion of scripture, and it's been so long since we've been together, it's wise for us to be reminded of what 2 Peter is all about. 2 Peter is a, an epistle that Peter wrote. He wrote two of them. And in the first one, he wrote to the church that was dispersed throughout all of the regions of what we would say today is Eastern Europe and parts of Western Turkey. And he spoke to them regarding the fact that they were, listen, they were of the diaspora. What is that? The diaspora. They were the ones that were escaping from their homes. The word means that they were driven from their homes for one reason and one reason only. They had become Christians in the Roman Empire. When the gospel was preached to them, they heard it, they responded, and they, listen, by witness, they knew inside that their lives had been changed. And that inside change was used by God to cause an outside witness. None of us have a witness internally. Do you know that? There is a witness that speaks to us internally, but that is the witness of the Holy Spirit speaking to you on the inside that you are a follower of Jesus, correct? That's what the Bible tells us. In fact, the Bible says uh, that our, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are, in fact, children of God. Very, very important. But the world doesn't know that. Fellow, listen, fellow brothers and sisters, I put that in quotes because time will prove this to be true, but among fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, the witness is established externally. And so he wrote to them about their salvation, he wrote to them about the security of their salvation, and he wrote to them about their position in Christ. And then some years went by. And Peter now writes to the same audience, but this time because persecution has broken out in a more violent manner, Nero having gone after the Christians, he writes to them in what we've labeled as a combat faith, that this faith is gonna take you all the way through to the end. And this faith is a faith, listen, that wars in the realm of wickedness and of darkness. And that it's going to take combat faith for you and I to discern and to uh, keep from being exposed to false teachers and false religions and false doctrines, which we know from Jesus and other scriptures would prevail in the last days. And so it's important for us to know that, very, very much so. And so now we pick it up in our uh, midpoint of chapter 2. And as we get ready to do that, I want to just give something to you. In fact, watch this. When we learn, uh, and I'm reading now from, from my notes. And by the way, remember, if you don't have my notes, you can get the notes uh, sent to you. If you get the app, uh, the notes will come to you in your mailbox or will be displayed in your notifications even before service begins. But having said that, uh, when we learn about false prophets and false teachers... Uh, we know something from the Bible. It tells us that they produce a, a godless lifestyle. It's always true. And in fact, that shouldn't come as a surprise to us when we begin to understand that the reality of what the Bible tells us uh, is the spiritual law of sowing and reaping. Uh, it, if, you, if you do something, it's going to have a reaction, correct? If you plant uh, seeds in the ground, you're going to have those seeds come up. If you, listen, if you plant corn in the ground, what's going to come up? corn. You know that. It's, the, it's God's law, both in nature and in spiritual existence, that whatever we sow, listen, as a believer, we are later going to reap because it's going to grow. It's going to sprout and it's going to be our experiential reality. If you and I are recreational Christians, you are going to have a recreational faith. And when you have a recreational faith, the world comes along and reality hits and your faith is swept away in the flood. But if you have an actual proven faith, a tested faith, a faith that you can depend upon because it's not on you, it's on God's word and God's faithfulness, then when those storms come, you will not only endure, you will be victorious in life's difficulties. 
And every pastor, now I would think it's safe to say in the world, not just America, every pastor is watching this happen to their churches. This last week, I'm hearing of more and more churches who are choosing now not to open their doors again. Not to open. It's too much, too hard. And I don't, I don't know about that. That's between them and God. But I tell you, listen, times are rough, but listen, as believers, we can face these days with strength and courage, understanding that our God is strong. We're not strong. He is strong. We hide in him, not in ourselves. And so it's a very important thing. And as we, uh, in fact, I'm going to do a little test to you in a moment. Uh, when, whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. Whatever's in you is going to come out. And uh, this is kind of a cute little test. Uh, fill in the blank. Birds of a feather. Okay, see? That could have come out of you unless it first went in you. Right? If you can't beat them. You will reap what you. In you, coming out of you. I was going to do a couple of Rolling Stone songs because they're funny lyrics and you would have filled them in and then everybody would have known your age if I would have done that, but it's in you. Listen, John Adams, the great um, founding father, graduate of Harvard Law, John Adams, the attorney, John Adams, the patriot and founder, founding father in the United States of America. Uh, a man, by the way, I might say at a time like this, never once owned a slave, John Adams. Very important to know that said in so few words a most profound truth. It was John Adams who said, facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be of our wishes, our inclinations, or dictates of our passion, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. You like that statement? I like that statement. That's a great word. And so as we look to this portion, as we look to our study today, uh, this is a great thing uh, for us to be looking at. It's our one and final point, church. Look at it. It's, it. This one point goes today, one and final point today, goes from verses 10 to 14, which you read a moment ago. Write this down if you would. What you really need to know as a believer in this day and age is about who's out there more than ever. Church, do you understand and do you believe that according to the Bible, we're living in the last days? That's what the Bible says. He says, I don't know about the last days. The Bible says since the day Christ came, it's the last days. These last 2,000 years or the last days. That's what the Bible says. If you've never heard this before, just know this, that the, in the entire 2,000 years are known as the last days, but we're on the other end of the last days. We're at the end of the end of the last days. You say, how do you know? Because the Bible tells us that as we approach the absolute end, there'll be deceivers everywhere. And they will be leading people astray by the words that they say and by the events that they promote and, and that the control they have over people. Everybody wants to beat up on church and say you're a bunch of mindless lemmings who get preached at and you're just led astray like little automatons. And they love to say that about you and about me because they don't know what they're talking about, but then they go right outside and they're led astray by their professors or by people at work or by what's on the internet. Somebody say amen. Is that not true? Someone is leading you. Who is it? Is it Jesus Christ or is it something else or is it someone else? If it's not Jesus Christ, then who is it that's leading you? And I'm going to tell you right now, you better not say, well, it's you, Pastor Jack. You go. We'll follow. Ain't going to happen. I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus just like you are and we'll walk together as we follow him. But never look to a man or to a system to be your strength or to be your salvation or to be your key to the presence of God. That would not be right. You want to be very careful about that. And so the very first argument point is this. What's out there are those who are proud. Write that down, please. Proud. Pride. All of us struggle with pride. Don't tell me you don't. Every single one of us do. It's deeply rooted in our human nature, and it is the foundation of all sin. Pride. Pride is. Proud. It's Satan's sin. Pride is how Satan, Lucifer, sinned and lost his position in heaven. Pride. 
It's the worst, absolute, most dangerous thing of all, and yet it's so disguised and it is so, uh, you know, covert, as it were, in our world that many times I think even we as Christians applaud a pride that is an antithesis to God in his ministry and his spirit. Pride. And we're going to see how that proud spirit in the person manifests itself in personal conduct. So if you look at it this way, they are authoritarian. In ministry, in life, in this world, how do we identify the dangerous teachers and the false prophets that are around us? They are number one, authoritarian. And it's a self-authority. Look at verse 10. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed, and they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries or of authorities. So when the Bible tells us that they walk according to their flesh, it implies this, everyone, in your note-taking, write it down, that they are absolutely self-sufficient. They are proud. How do you recognize a false uh, prophet or a false teacher or a false brother or sister in Christ? Number one, they, they will be condescending upon you when it comes to spiritual matters. They're proud. They have a special insight that nobody else has. We will, I will tell you the right way. I know that for 2,000 years it was said this way, but God has given me special enlightenment on this topic. And the Holy Spirit, I know, I trust in you, will say, watch out, step back, plug your ears, run. There's a warning to that. Why? Because they're authoritarian on their own doing. They promote themselves. They're very much self-promoters. Everything about them is about them. The word uncleanness is a powerful word. I'm going to give you some some words here that cause the scripture to, out of the English, come a little bit more colorful in the original language. The Greek word uncleanness, the word means defilement. Listen to this. It means filth. It means decay. It means rot. Listen to this. It gets better. Um, The stench of an open pit. You say, well, I don't... Open pit, what do you mean? Oh, no, the the word means that there's an open, stagnant pool or pit. And have you ever seen such a grotesque thing where the, 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 the moisture or the wet inside of it looks thick and it's rotten and it stinks and you see bugs and stuff going off of it and you even see dead animals bloated and floating in it. Am I making this gross to you? I can't do it enough. I don't have the, 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 uh, enough vivid of an imagination. It is a wretch of a pit stench. The Bible's graphic. These people have an, a wretchedness about who they are. And they don't see it. Their arrogance and their authority and their pride has blinded them. The next word, authority here, they despise authority is an interesting word. Some of your Bibles rightly say governments, that they despise governments. Some scriptures will tell you in the footnote, which I happen to believe in the context of the, of the passages that we're looking at or that we read today, is the fact that the word can also be translated that they despise spiritual authorities. They don't, they don't have any, any respect at all for the things of God. Now, that's a correct way to interpret it for this reason. They don't have any respect for the things of God. But church, let me ask you, is God ordained authority from God? Are the governments from God? The Bible says they are. Is the police officer from God? Is the police officer from God when the lights, the blue and red lights are on behind you? Yes. (laughs) Are the rules of the law of God? Yes. Very important that we understand that. Authority, the powers, powers that are established, again, predominantly in the spiritual realm, which is very telling because these guys that we're talking about, they are going to wind up hating the authorities that God has put into place. And of course, it's rooted in spiritual realities. And then the word presumptuous, this is an amazing word. The word presumptuous here, this is all adding to the fact that they're proud The false prophet, the false teacher, the false pastor, the false evangelist, they're proud. Man, I got to tell you, just standing up here, when I just, in my mind, I see a kaleidoscope of faces from my TV screen of proud, 
authoritative, condescending, look, ministers. <laughs> Is that not oxymoronic? To say that you're a minister, but you need to serve me. No, not in the kingdom of God, no. Jesus never once said, by the way, everybody, serve me. Now, let's be honest. It's not stated, but it is certainly made clear that anyone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ devotes their life in service to him. But he doesn't ask for it. That's a good thing for, that's a good thing for us to remember. An authoritarian will come up and say, you need to serve me, you need to do this, you need to do the other, and they ask, and they push, and they promote. Jesus extends his heart to you and he bears his soul to you and he invites you to come and walk with him. It's like a good marriage. In a good marriage, the husband never has to say, you need to submit to me, woman. <laughs> that never, listen, if you're in a good marriage, none of that stuff happens. She never has to say to him, you need to love me like Jesus loves the church. Okay? No, if you're in a good marriage, that, that never comes up. You want to know why? Because out of love, it's happening. You don't have to write it down. It's written on the heart. These false prophets and false teachers know nothing about that. They're authoritarian, and they're rotting, and they're corrupt on the inside. But we'll see soon that it manifests itself in their lifestyles. And so presumptuous, they're reckless. The word means to be reckless with their body. It means to be self-abusing. Isn't that interesting, presumptuous? The Greek word means to endanger themselves and others having no regard for the value of life. It means, listen, it means to take your existence. Young people, listen up to this. To take who you are and to throw yourself at life in a reckless manner. That's what false teachers do. They throw themselves and when it says that they're reckless, they're reckless with, because they're given over to their passions. They can't hold themselves back. They, can't, they don't have self-control. By the way, you see all the evil happening in the world? Listen, just remember this. You heard it here first years ago. Sin always overplays its hand because it has no self-control. If you give sin an inch, it will take a mile. If you give lawlessness a moment, it will take the day. That's how it works. And when you allow an appetite to prevail in your life, it's going to take over. These false prophets, false teachers, false pastors, these who are false ministers, they may say something publicly on the outside, but down deep inside, you just feel, there's something wrong. There's just something wrong. I don't know what it is. There's something wrong. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit when he's speaking to you on that. Over time, in due time, things will be revealed. And don't be surprised if you find out that they're reckless with their body. So what do you mean by that? I knew you'd ask, so here it is. They'll justify their drug abuse or their alcoholism as ministers. They will justify their sexual escapades as being ministers. They will quote verses that say, well, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And they'll wrestle with the Bible to their own destruction. Does that make sense? They will use the word of God to justify their actions and then they'll seek to lead you into the same path. They destroy people. More than ever, there are false prophets and false teachers in all kinds of venues today. It doesn't have to be church. I, listen, church is certainly the target of Satan. But today, people are being duped by the second, by what they allow into their lives. I sound like a broken record and a dinosaur all in one. Stop reading stuff on the internet. You have no way of knowing if it's true or not. Oh, did you hear? No, I don't want to hear. Oh, did you read? No, I don't want to read. You don't know if it's true. Yeah, but this person said, do you know that person? And people who have no fence, their minds are running wild and running loose because somebody's speaking into their lives, listen, authoritatively. We need to gird up the loins of our minds, says the scripture. But you need to regard, listen, a Christian will regard their body. What do I mean by that? You know that the book of Romans says, this is kind of graphic, but it's true. Book of Romans says you need to possess your members. You say, was that a pastoral verse toward the church? Nope. 
it means I need to control my private parts. Amen. You, are you a Christian today? If you're a Christian today, you're supposed to control your private parts. <laughs> now, this is interesting. As soon as I said private parts, you thought of, you thought of one thing. Depends if you're a male or female. You thought of a couple things of a female and one thing of a male. And you missed the mark. Because you know, my, you know where my private parts begin? Right here in the mind, eye gate, right? He, hearing gate goes in. What do I allow viewed? What am I listening to? Have you noticed you can listen to praise music all day long and you change the channel and you get some thing from uh, Lady Gaga or Aerosmith or... And it's in your head. Have you noticed that? Why is that? Because the, our minds are like sponges. And we have to be careful. Very, very careful. What you allow your body to be involved in is a very, very serious thing. Because listen, we, this, this, is, <laughs> this is truth, but nobody believes this anymore. According to the Bible, God owns our bodies. He gave us our bodies. We run around, do with them what we want. And God says, that's my body. I gave you, you're using the body I gave you and you're using it for unrighteousness. Stop it. And we'll either choose to repent and submit to God and bow to him or we'll say, nope, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna fulfill the lust of my desires, my passions. It doesn't have to be sexual. It can be anything that departs or causes us to depart from God. Listen, I, I'm gonna, I'll share something with you that just absolutely drives me crazy, and I can't watch this stuff. But do you remember years and years ago, I had to leave the room. Remember years ago, there was a show called The Fear Factor? I couldn't take that show. Now, look, I'm a guy. Blood and guts and bang, bang, shoot him up. I love that stuff. I, I've been blowing stuff up since I was a little kid. Remember? I, oh, come on, guys. Remember we were kids? Didn't you love blowing stuff up? We used to blow our models up. I'd build model airplanes and put them out in the yard and blow them up. Um, remember we used to put uh, little mice in the strawberry baskets? Remember the plastic strawberry baskets? They were green. And we would put a mouse in the basket and then tape the strings with thread to a helium balloon and send them to Vegas or wherever he was going. Do you remember that? That was awesome. Did you ever put tape on a snail and put them on your kite and let them, let them fly on the end of your kite? Come on. What's wrong with you? Yes. Yes. Come on. Can I get an amen? Amen. But listen, you watch the Fear Factor stuff, and the guy goes, okay, now, who's, let's see if you can handle this. And everybody's at the table. Okay, what are we going to eat? We're going to eat a donkey nose. Yeah, and see if you can eat it. And what's that? This is a turtle intestines. You ever seen that show? It's sick. You know why I don't like it? Because I think it's defiling the glory of the human body. You're, you're, you're eating stuff that an animal won't even eat. And then there's boxing, you know, some people can. But now, there, now that's not enough. You got to get in a cage and kill somebody. You know what? I'm not talking about the skills. I'm not. It is a human body creating the image of God that's being destroyed. That's the word that these guys do. In their, once they leave the screen or the, or the studio or the pulpit, they take their lives and they throw their lives to their passion. If you know anything about people who have been given over to their passions, they live a very violent and it trends violent in the sin that they pursue. Ted Bundy started out looking at pornography and then he got into worse pornography and then worse pornography and then Ted Bundy wound up doing what he saw at the last stage of pornography and he began to kill women. You say, well, that would never happen to me. Don't think that you can bring a flaming log or stick into your chest and that it not burn you. It will burn you. Your body belongs to God. If you're not a Christian today, your body still belongs to God, but this, this sermon doesn't apply to you. You're lost. You got bigger problems. But if you're a Christian today, your body belongs to God. And Peter is exposing people who claim to be believers and even leaders, but they live an aberrant lifestyle. Listen to what J. Vernon McGee says. It's golden. They are worse than animals. Having been created in the image of God, they have taken themselves out of the domain of human and have become vicious, vile, and violent. 
It's the age we're in. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 tells us, Romans 3, 10. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside and they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. This is what the Bible says. Their throat is an open tomb. Wow. With their tongues, they have perfected deceit. The poison of asp or poisonous snakes is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their path. The word path here means in their wake. When they go, watch, whoever he's talking about, which is, by the way, all of humanity apart from Christ, that's what he means, are you guys listening? Yes. Wherever they go, left in their wake is destruction. Think about that for a moment. To help you, what's become of Seattle? This verse. What's become of Minneapolis? This verse. What's become of Detroit? This verse. It's exactly what's happening in our world around us. Are you not a Christian today? Look at this verse. And then look at the news. Look at this verse. And then go to parts of Los Angeles. And you're going to tell me you can't trust the Bible? The Bible anticipated this conduct. When a man is given over to his own self being the authority of his life and not God, this is what he does. Verse 17 says, And the way of peace they've not known. Here's the reason, verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. I promise you this, none of those people rioting and throwing bricks through buildings and uh, attacking and destroying things, I hesitated a moment because I was talking to a police officer this last week who uh, was involved in, in one of the riots and they, they threw, and I guess this has been going on, uh, they threw uh, lighter fluid on him and try to light him on fire. Uh, so listen, why do, I, why do I bring that up? This is animalistic. In fact, that's not even fair to animals, is it, to say that? In fact, you know, I, I love dogs like you love dogs. And I saw somebody's really cool dog the other day and I said, Could, isn't it, wouldn't it be great at a time like this if, if more people were like dogs? You say, yeah, you know, that's a good point. Where's hey, listen. We're not animals. The animal kingdom doesn't do this. It's proof that we are creating an image of God because we've departed from God. And if someone departs from God, how, how good can a human be? Really good. How good can a human be? How bad can a human be? Really bad. A cow? A cow can be... A cow... Little good, little bad, I don't know. A monkey, I hate monkeys, but a monkey can be good and bad. But a human, when they're really, really, really good, they act like God. It's beautiful, compassionate, caring. But when they're really, really bad, they can outdo a demon. And we see our nation running amok because not only did the rioters forget God, let's be honest, our nation has forgotten God. There's no fear of God in us as a nation. Every man's doing what is right in his own eyes, says the Bible. Is that not true? All this stuff going on is absolutely crazy. You don't know what to do now. The confusion, as we talked about last week, the confusion in the atmosphere is rampant. You don't know what, you know, tomorrow, the rules today are this and they're gonna be different tomorrow. Why? Because nobody knows what they're doing. Confused. Secondly, the false teachers, false ministries, look at verses 11 to 12. Uh, they are without feeling. They have no feelings. Whereas angels, verse 11, who are greater in power and might, meaning angels are more powerful than us, obviously, they do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. So what does that mean? Just simply this. It's amazing. Man will curse God and other men, and, and man will curse angels in the spiritual realm. And Peter is making a point that angels don't even do that kind of stuff. Angels never talk bad about people. Isn't that interesting to know? Angels don't do that. They don't talk bad about people. 
I don't have the verse in front of me, but you'll look it up later. And, you, you, and I mentioned it again a couple of weeks ago. Do you remember when the Bible tells us, it's in the book of Jude, where Michael and Satan are fighting over the body of Moses when, he's, when he died. It's really weird. But the scripture tells us that Michael didn't say, I rebuke you, Satan. Have you ever heard somebody tell you? Have you ever seen that on TV? The Bible says never do that. The Bible says the Lord rebuke you, Satan. That's a very powerful thing to remember. Oh, you just stick your hand up. You hold your hand up. You rebuke that devil. You just tell him I'm standing here and then you rebuke him. <laughs> uh, that's not in the Bible. You can talk like that, but just you should say it. <laughs> the Lord rebuked you, devil. <laughs> I guess if you talk like that, it has more authority. <laughs> I don't know, no. In 1 Peter 4, verse, 1 Timothy, excuse me, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, it says, now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in the latter times or the last days, some will depart from the faith. I believe that's happening. Giving heed to deceiving spirits. Yep. And doctrines of demons, aberrant teachings. It doesn't have to be trapped in religiosity. Doctrines of demons, anything that leads astray. Think about that for a moment. Doctrines of demons. Is it possible to have deceiving spirits teach doctrines of demons in the halls of power? What about a courtroom? What about a classroom? Is it possible in a small little fellowship of a few people? What about what a parent is teaching their child? Is it biblically based and is it honoring to Christ or could it be a doctrine that was spawned by demons? You know what? I absolutely believe for a lot of reasons, evolution, the theory of it is a doctrine of demons. So how can you say that? Don't you believe in science? That's why I don't believe in evolution. I believe in science. Science and the God that invented science says the exact same thing about everything. Man comes along and he doesn't want to have God in his mind, so he reinterprets the evidence that's in front of him and twists it with a doctrine from a demon to take the glory from God and to turn us around to worship and serve the creation rather than the creator that's blessed forever. Amen. Doctrines of demons. What about legislation? What about arguments that we see coming from our halls of power? Listen, Christian, put your ears on. That could be a form of doctrines of demons of what's being said. We don't think like that. We think it's relegated to a really goofy church down the street with some strange architecture and some, you know, weird setup. No. We want to be very careful. I mentioned evolution a moment ago. Listen, I, this is something I just need to get out. It has nothing to do with the Bible study today. Everybody's talking about the COVID thing, and now they're announcing, here it comes. It's a, it's a big one. The big one's coming. The first one was nothing. The real big one's coming. Well, I'll say, where's the science? I want to see the science. But here's the deal. What I find fascinating is what we do know about COVID, which is not much, what we do know is that it targets the weak. Right? If you're compromised, you should be careful. As a Christian, we are to be wise about that, and we are to be loving about that, and we're to be on guard about that. Listen, if you're watching or if you're here right now and you're an evolutionist, you have a whole different worldview on this. Let's be honest. And I haven't heard anyone talk about this yet. Can you imagine somebody coming up to the microphone? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the professor of uh, nincompoopery at the University of... <laughs> and uh, we, all need to, we all need to know that this is part of the evolutionary experience. Listen to the hypocrisy of this. You know it's not true. This is part of the evolutionary experience. You just, you just need to let it go. You just, it, it's targeting the weak. It's what evolution does. And have a good day. <laughs> is that not the theory? Why would you try to help anybody? Why would you try to be safe? Why would you try to care? Why would you try to comfort? But you're not hearing that anywhere. Why? 
Because evolution's a lie from the pit of Satan's hell. It's a lie that draws people away from God. You don't have to go to church to get deceived. You can walk into a classroom. You can read a book. Verse 12 goes on, but these are like brute beasts made to be caught. This is so serious. And destroyed because evil, uh, because they speak evil of things that they don't understand. And they, that is, they utterly perish in their own corruption. This is incredible. Notice what the Bible says here, that they will utterly perish in their own corruption. It's a very graphic presentation to us that what they're spewing will actually come back upon them and be their demise. In fact, Jesus, didn't Jesus say this in the Gospels? He said, be careful how you judge people. Because with what judgment you levy against them, that's the exact same judgment I'm going to levy on you. If you go around, if you're a sin sniffer and a fault finder and everybody, oh, they're this way. Oh, look at that one. I can't talk to them. They're a this and so and this and that. Oh, look at that one. And oh boy, whew, I know us holy ones over here. And, then, and listen, you better be, you better be so, so repentant on that. Pointing things out. That's God's business to do. When he does it, yeah, we take action. But we're not the ones to initiate that. But we're watching all these things, this corruption play out in the world around us. This word is powerful because when it says that they're to be like natural brute beasts, this, church, this is hard to, this is hard to say. You, I, you know, listen, for those of you who are visiting, we go through the Bible verse by verse. That's how you get the entire word of God. And by the way, that's how Jesus taught See, because the reason why I say that is because who would, have, who would have a service? Who would have a church service? Hey, welcome, come on in. We're going to talk about God hunting down the brute beast of, of men who are given over to their passions and this is what they're going to inherit. And who wants to hear this? But we have to hear this. The word means this. The word implies that God is the hunter. This is very, very graphic. There are those who are violent, animal-like, godless people who are walking the earth making mischief. Are you with me? Your temptation and mine is to say, why doesn't somebody do something? And somebody should do something. That's why we are, you know, we're, we're supposed to have uh, civility. God loves civility. But beyond that, the, the evilness of it. How could this happen? What's going on? Just know this. They're not getting away with anything. The Bible here says, you need to tell your friends when you go to work tomorrow. The Bible says God is hunting them down. You see some guy, and I'm, this is the extreme. Of course, it doesn't have to be this way. Somebody who beats his wife, God's hunting you down. Somebody who's abusing a child, God is hunting you. Let me tell you, God needs no permit, and he never has to reload. He is holy and righteous, and when evil's being perpetrated and you think you get away from it, know this, God's hunting you. He's stalking you like a lion in righteousness. And this evil is going on, and this verse tells us, especially in the context of false teachers, God is hunting. You say, I don't know if I like that. It's a fact. People who are perpetrating evil, you can hear God, as it were, loading. And he's about ready to bring judgment. And it's, it's dead serious. The Bible tells us that he's pursuing them, just like a brute beast is hunted down, caught, he says, here, and destroyed. Ver, uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 11. Proverbs 1, 11. If they say, come with us, bad, these are bad people, people you're hanging out with. You know, we need to pray about this. This is on my mind. I don't know if it's from God or not, but for, after we get done with Peter, I was thinking, maybe praying, Lord, should we do Proverbs because our world has gone nuts? Maybe we should be doing, maybe we should do Proverbs on a Sunday, but look what he says. If there's people, imagine your kids, one of your kids' friends says, come with us. Let us lie in wait to shed innocent blood. 
Let's lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. You can turn your TV on and watch that. I saw the strangest thing, maybe you saw it too, where a, a man had looted an electrical store, had a bunch of stuff in his cart, and he's going down the street or an alley. And this was drone footage from one of our cities in America. And the looter got robbed <laughs> by people who were going to loot the store. They were walking by and, they, and they, you can see it. They go like this and they see, wow. And they, and they just absolutely punched the guy out and took the stuff that he stole. Is there no law? Hey, I stole this fair and square. <laughs> but isn't that an animal world? Yes. It is, huh? Watch out for those who say, come, let's go. Come on, let's go have a, let's have a good time. Let's go have some fun. It's terrifying. We're living in an age where good is evil and evil is good. And things are twisted. I believe these are all sourced and rooted ultimately in spiritual warfare. So I wrote this down. It might offend some of you, but I had to get it off my heart. I can go outside. Or I can't go outside. Not supposed to go outside. Like the maniacs are free to do roaming our streets. I have got to be curfewed so they can run amok in our cities. Is this too much truth for people? You guys all right? Listen, they don't want us to go to church, but we can go outside and riot. We're supposed to keep a gathering to no more than 100 people, but thousands can be in a store looting it. Our elected officials tell us to obey them while they obey the anarchist. Our elected officials swear to uphold the Constitution while they turn around and wage war against it. The police are called to stand down while the guilty attack the innocent. Our elected officials condemn a church service for uh, but then go about and encourage, listen to this, encourage rioters to exercise their First Amendment rights. That was defended this last week. They're just expressing their First Amendment right. And a reporter on CNN said, it is a merry caravan of protesters. And as he was reporting, somebody hit him. It's on film. Sorry, it's very sad and funny at the same time. He's talking about how great it is. And he was hit with lawlessness. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 15. Uh, I'll end soon. I can kind of feel the feeling in the room right now. It's like, what's going on? This is normal for this church, by the way. I just wanted you to know that. But, uh, but anyway, listen to this. This is where we live. This is where we live. The Bible is relevant here and now. The Bible is the answer here and now. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 15. Think about this. As we read this 3,000-year-old document, think about your world. Humanity will be destroyed and people brought down. Even the arrogant will be lower, uh, their eyes in hum uh, humiliation. But the Lord of heaven's army will be exalted by his justice. The holiness of God will be displayed by his righteousness. In that day, lambs will find food or good pastures and fattened sheep and young goats will feed among the ruins. What sorrow for those who drag their sins behind them with ropes made of lies, who drag wickedness behind them like a cart. They even mock God and say, hurry up and do something. We want to see what you can do. Let the Holy One of Israel carry out his plan, for we want to know what it is. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and they think themselves so clever. What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking wine 
and boast about all the alcohol they can hold or consume. They take bribes to let the wicked go free and they punish the innocent. Hello? Therefore, just as the fire licks up stubble and dry grass shrivels in the flames, so their roots will rot and their flowers will wither. For they have rejected the law of the Lord of heaven's armies. They have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. That is why the Lord's uh, anger burns against them and why he has raised his fist to crush them. The mountains tremble and the corpses of his people litter the streets like garbage. But even then, the Lord's anger is not satisfied. His fist is still poised to strike. He will send a signal to distant nations far away and whistle to those who will not get tired or or, uh, stumble. They will not stop for rest or sleep. Not a belt will loose or be loosed. Not a sandal strap broken. Their arrows will be sharp in their bows and ready for battle. He's talking about a coming judgment from a foreign nation. Sparks will fly from their horses' hooves and the wheels of their chariots will spin like a whirlwind. They will roar like lions, like the strongest of lions, growling. They will pounce on their victims and carry them off, and no one will be, able to, uh, will be there to rescue them. Verse 30, they will roar over their victims on that day of destruction like the roaring of the sea. If someone looks across the land, only darkness and distress will be seen. Even the light will be darkness or darkened by clouds. No one wants to study that stuff, even though we did in the book of Isaiah. Nobody wants to study that. It doesn't fit the narrative of our, of our emotions. It doesn't fit the narrative of what we want. See, listen, why did you say, Jack, why did you t- tell us this to make this point? If I was a hireling, if I was a false teacher and a false prophet, I never would have given you that passage. Why? Because God says, I'm going to judge all wickedness. And don't think America's exempt. Okay? He says, I must first begin my judgment at the house of the Lord. Did you know that? God says, I start with my church first. So whatever's going on in America regarding church, God is behind it. He may not be causing it, but he's using it. And he's purging, he's cleansing his church. And then finally we'll end here. I got nine seconds. Uh, (laughs) Verses 13 to 14. Listen, they're given over. Their, 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 Their pride has caused them to be given over. Verse 13. And will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it a pleasure to carouse in the daytime. The word means broad daylight. They carouse in the day. What does carouse mean? It it means this. It means they go about doing all manners of mischief to carouse. They go around making trouble. They used to do it at night, but it's gotten so bad they do it in the day. Does that sound familiar? Isn't it amazing? Why would you do such a thing? Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Why are you doing such a thing? Whatever he says, know this, it's rooted in pride. It's rooted in pride. For, listen, this is why the gospel is the only answer for our, our crazy day. Um, I think we're done. We can, it, it's, it's, time's up. It's, actually, let's finish the verse though. Keep, look at verse 13. While they feast with you, that's scary, they feast with you. This is a ch- church setting. Let's have a potluck. Okay, just know there's going to be wolves in sheep's clothing that show up with some souffle that could be poisoned, if not their mouth, right? Verse 14 says, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, looking what they can get from somebody, enticing unstable souls. What does that mean? People who are not rooted and grounded get sucked away by these people. Hang on to your seats. They will have a heart trained in covetous practices. They are accursed children. Wow. Last night, Lisa and I were having this discussion, and as we talk, we're talking with people. We talk to people all the time, but we're watching a trend, and I'm going to reach out to some pastors across the nation that I know this week to ask them this. You can close your Bible. You can stand. We're watching something that's never been seen before. And it's this. 
we're watching people who, in category A, they, whatever level of Christianity, whatever growth, whatever maturity, they are, they don't need to come back to church anymore. They're fine with it. They don't need to. They don't care to. Whatever. And then there's a different category who they're knocking down the doors to get in here. <laughs> and we've found out something. And I'm, I'm gonna, I got to do the science on this to make sure it's for real. When I began to ask at the first of this last week, are we ready, staff, are we ready to go full bore? Has, how's everything been working? And I was assuming that it's going to take forever to get back our children's ministers because, you know, it's all done by incredible. You're the team that does it. And the parking ministry and the ushers and the greeters and everything, you just can't turn the key in, you know what I'm saying? Well, I was wrong. And this is a lesson for all of us. The people who are trying to bust down the door to get back to church are the people who are serving. Listen, listen, that's going to sting. Not you, it's going to sting some. When pastors told me, you're doing it, you should never be doing that. You should not be opening your doors. It dawned on me. They're, they feel fine about what they're doing because they're teaching people online. They're using their gift. So they feel usable. Are you hearing me? Yeah. The body of Christ, who wants to serve the body of Christ, they're not being, they were not being used during this time of sequestering. And so they're just biting at the bit. They can't wait. It's like, I got to get back. And the, listen, if a pastor's not careful, the pastor's saying, oh, calm down, calm down. It's all going fine. For you, it is. Because you're, you're, you're exercising your gift. What about the flock that makes the church happen? And so I was blown away. So I asked the question this week. So if we open up full bore, do you have your people? Uh-huh. No, you don't understand what I'm asking you. Do you have your people to meet the need and the demands of... Yes. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? <laughs> yeah, we're ready to go. Well, what about, what about your usher? We got him. Really? What about the children's ministry? Got him. Here's the point. The people who've been serving couldn't wait to get back to church. They're going to knock the doors down. The people who don't, listen, if no, one's, if no one is dependent upon your Christian growth, if they're not serving, they have no pressure to get back to church. They have no passion to get back to church. And even in that, there's a fear and a danger of deception. Be very careful about what's out there and who's out there. The greatest news in the world is that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and all your sin and mine. Amen. And Jesus rose again from the dead, exactly as the Bible said he would. You can't get to heaven, as we read Romans 3, you can't get to heaven by being good. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have failed. We've all failed. And I'll end with a story. I'm actually ahead of schedule. Don't, but you're, we're done. We are done. <laughs> we're really done. I was, in a, I was in a flat, invited to a man's flat, a family's flat in St. Petersburg, Russia. We had been preaching the gospel on the streets. The man said, will you come to my house tonight? And um, according to this man, we were sitting at his table, he said, my, my wife, my wife might need God. I understand. My daughter, my daughter might need God. I, I see why they need God, believe me. <laughs> but I, I do not need, I don't need God. I'm a, I'm a very good man. So why do I need this Jesus. Listen, I'm telling you, I'll never forget it because God grabbed my mouth in this moment. Watch what happened. And I said, have you ever heard of cyanide? You know, cyanide? You know, of course. And I said, well, okay. So, of course, I didn't have any with me, but <laughs> I grabbed a glass of water and I took a lemon on the table and I said, imagine if this was cyanide. And I dropped four drops into this, stirred it up, 
and handed it to you. Will you drink it? Nyet. <laughs> and I said, what about if I put two drops, only two drops, in the water? Only two. Would you drink it? No. How about if I put one drop of cyanide poison in this beautiful clear glass of water? Would you drink it then? Never. Why? One drop will kill you. And I said, listen, if you were climbing up a cliff on a chain and you pulled up on that chain and you went to, through 10,000 links on that chain, but you got right to the top and one broke, one grasp ahead of you, what would you do? He goes, I'd fall. And I said, so at what point, at what point do you stand and negotiate with God to say to him, I'm good, I don't need you, because now that I've known about you, I'll, I'll, we're good. When you start in life with drops of cyanide in you, when you start tainted, today you might be thinking, well, this is great, you know, all you people need God. No, you need God. Because, you know, you're, you are tainted with an invisible droplet of sin. And the Bible says no sin can be before God. That's why we all need Christ. No one's going to heaven without him. And so today you need to trust him and put your faith in him. Thanks for watching the Real Life YouTube channel. We love bringing you content that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss one single video or live stream and you can share it with friends and family. If you'd like to support this ministry by helping us reach others, by taking the gospel and the teaching around the world, you can do so by clicking the Give Now button. So thanks again for watching and God bless.